By the next morning, my eyes just streamed all night. I couldn't open my eyes. Rang the surgeon who'd done the work and said, you know, this is this is terribly wrong. And worse was the kind of the knock-on effect it left me with some kind of PTSD. From injectables of every description to energy-based skin tightening procedures, laser rejuvenation and much more, beauty journalist Alice Hart Davis has tried just about every cosmetic treatment going all in the name of testing them out on our behalf. She wrote the book, The Tweakment's Guide to help consumers make more informed choices about the various options available and what to expect from them. Now, there's a Tweakment's Guide website where Alice continues to bring us updated information and treatment reviews to keep pace with this fast evolving industry. But out of everything she's tried, which are her most and least favorite treatments? What went horribly wrong? And what's the very expensive and much hyped home device that she definitely doesn't rate highly? Well, let's find out as Alice joins us now today to share what she's learned from over 25 years of tweakments testing. Alice, it's so good to have you on the channel. Thank you. Well, thank you for asking me. Great to be here. Because I read the tweakments guide a few years ago now, and it's really clear you've tried just about everything going. And that's incredibly helpful for people considering different treatment options out there to have that level of information. Like me, you're a journalist, and I'm curious to know how you found your way into the world of beauty and aesthetics? Yeah, that's a good question, because I had been a very general purpose journalist for quite a while before. Um, but I was working on the Evening Standard in London, and I was writing a lot of health stuff. And the features editor said, all these doctors out there, this was like the late 1990s, she said, they're, they're doing stuff to people's faces. And I said, you're right. And she's like, yeah, you know, needles, lasers. Uh, I said, I don't know. And she said, well, get out there and find out. So um, I did, and it was fascinating because it was very much when aesthetic medicine, as the, as the whole area is called, is was in its infancy, and there were hospital dermatologists who were using lasers for skin resurfacing, but it was quite savage stuff. You know, you'd end up looking like a peeled tomato, and lots of people were using um, injectable toxins for wrinkle relaxing, so that's Botox and other types of things, but, but people didn't really know about it. But central London, it was going on. And I was fascinated. So I started writing about it um, and also about beauty then and have been yeah heavily into it ever since. And did you find even back then there was a response from readers? Because of course, it's not, yeah. we didn't have the internet or not really yeah. in that way. So it would have been reader letters and so on. Were you, were you picking up a response even back then? Oh, yes. I mean, everyone was terrified of Botox because it had been, well, it was a perfect storm sort of for, for, for the tabloids who said, you know, peop, women, desperate, idiotic women are resorting to a deadly poison, was the phrase they always used, which botulinum is, is, a, is a deadly poison, very, very poisonous, um, in, all, in, in a kind of futile bid to stave off um, the, the onward march of time. And, and so once that became sunk in people's collective consciousness. It was very hard to shift that. And I would find the sub-editors would often put in a phrase like deadly poison into the pieces I was writing. And then I would get a, a letter from the lawyers of the firm behind Botox mm -hmm. saying, excuse me, but this is a very well-known drug. It's very well tested, etc." So, but that perception um, is quite hard to shift. And I think for a lot of people that's still there 25 years later. Um, but even back then, it was possible to round up uh, enough women for a feature to say, we'd rather miss the dentist than skip our Botox injections. Um, it was that popular and people were reasonably open about it, which I, it's taken a very long time for that to change. Because I think even now, a lot of people would much rather not admit that they do something like this. There's still a certain shame around having procedures, particularly ones that involve a needle. People are much happier talking about energy treatments with light to remove pigmentation. They think that's absolutely fine. Celeb celebs will talk about that. But as soon as you're injecting something with a needle, um, it, it flips the switch in many people's minds. They want to give the illusion, particularly celebrities, that it's pretty natural, a little bit of red light, a little bit of laser, and somehow it all just keeps hanging together. But 
you know, we know, fortunately, there's there's some good folks out there. I've interviewed one of them, uh, Dr. Johnny Betridge, who are kind of picking that apart on Instagram yeah. and other places for us to let us know what they're really doing. I could sort of ease my way into this or just come in with the big question that I guess every person who sits next to you at a dinner table asks, like, what's the best thing you've ever had for your face, do you think, the biggest difference you've seen? It's a really different, difficult question to answer because what's best for me is not going to be best for somebody else. It, it all depends on what you want. If you're somebody with sucking great wrinkles down the middle of your forehead, you want something to relax those wrinkles. If you've got pigmentation, you want something to clear it. And the thing that makes the most difference in the short term will be a bigger, more aggressive, more invasive procedure. So last year I had an energy treatment with plasma, nitrogen plasma, which not unlike uh, a CO2 laser kind of burns off the top layer of your skin. So you shed all that over the next week or so. It didn't look very pretty on Instagram, but 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 my audience loved it. They they were horrified and addicted to seeing it all come off in equal measure, and 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 that leaves your skin incredibly smooth, fresh, uh, much less pigment when the newer skin comes through. Um, I had a fat transfer procedure about five years ago. They take is quite serious as well because it involves liposuction, taking the fat out of your thighs or tummy, purifying it and using it like a filler to kind of restructure your face, um, refilling up the sort of the bony arches of the face uh, because we lose bone from our skull as we get older as well as fat. So your skull is basically shrinking inside your head. So padding out the arches up here. Uh, along here and along the angle of the jaw and the chin with fat, that made a dramatic change. And because not all the fat will survive in the place it's been put, in order for it to survive, it has to sort of grow a new blood supply. So when you have fat transfer, you need to be overcorrected a bit um, mm -hmm. because a certain amount of it will fall away. One doctor friend who was looking at me a couple of weeks later and struggling to be polite said, it looks very strong, he said. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So were you quite full at that point? Uh, not not so much full because it wasn't it wasn't um, putting back volume in the mid face or anything. But the definition of the face was very kind of almost like an AI would do it. But, um, it was good and it lasted quite a long time. But often what really makes a difference for people is a combination of procedures because People always want something that's going to be a magic bullet, one, one off fix for everything. But and 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 for that, probably a a consistent skincare regime involving a sunscreen and b a retinoid is going to be your best bet over time and a healthy lifestyle. But for tweakments, it's it's kind of what do you want it to do? If you're losing volume in your face and you want that put back, that's going to need. Um, volumizing fillers. Fillers are really the only thing that can do that, apart from that. If you've got masses of pigmentation, age spots, laser or IPL light will do that. If you want um, wrinkles softened everywhere, you need um, muscle relaxing um, injections that will help those lines uh, disperse. If you want skin tightening, you want energy treatments that will gradually firm up the skin, re boost the collagen that we're all losing with age. So, um, and, and, and then you want to freshen the condition of the skin with injectable moisturizers or polynucleotides or some of these regenerative treatments that can really help the skin condition. So it can be a bit like painting the fourth bridge, you know, because by the time you've done a course of some of each of these, you're back at the start and think, oh, the pigmentation's coming back. I need to tackle that. So if you had a bottomless budget, you could spend your whole time going round and round on these things, but you don't wanna you don't wanna lose your perception of what you actually look like and what's normal. Which can happen and you see it happen so often that people's look just changes. I think that's half half the battle and to me it seems to come down to practitioner every time you've got that person who's got the artistic eye and that's you know, people ask how do you choose a practitioner like that? That is the hardest thing. How, do, how how would you recommend that people go about choosing somebody who has that artistic eye, knows how to underplay it? Yes, because even if they have all the right qualifications, and there aren't really any specific qualifications for all of these things other than having a, a medical background and having done a lot of training, um, 
but and, and there's no laws around these things. But even when there are, we hope in future, you can't legislate for artistic um, abilities. So you, 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 you need somebody who has done a lot of the training, had a lot of experience to put that all into practice, but, but who then has that indefinable extra of knowing how to create loveliness in a face. Um, and hanging around in people's waiting rooms, um, which I do quite a lot. You know, if you see who the rest of their patients are, you think, yeah, that's that's a that that's a pretty good a pretty good idea. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons I set up the Tweakments Guide as a, as a website, just to try and list all the practitioners who I know who do good work. You know, you've mentioned a few treatments along the way, and I know you'll be more than aware. Um that there are pros and cons of various aesthetic treatments. I mean, often they are painted uh, when we hear them being discussed by practitioners as sort of totally harmless and you just get all these benefits and, and no downsides whatsoever. But I think as time is passing, we are becoming more and more aware that there are some negative effects to consider and certainly pros and cons. So I just wanted to work through some of the more popular treatments of, of the moment and kind of gauge your, your views on them. Um, starting with the biostimulators, if we could. So I'm talking about the likes of Radius and Sculptra, um, others that are designed to stimulate new tissue growth and collagen formation so that your skin is doing its own filling, if you like, rather than having that injectable filler like hyaluronic acid which would fill immediately. So I've I've spoken to a few aesthetic doctors who have said they don't use them because they feel they're less controllable than something like hyaluronic acid. You know, you can't immediately reverse it. Um, you can't dissolve it. And I also recently spoke to a plastic surgeon who said that he had noticed changes in the skin tissue of, of some of the patients that he'd operated on who'd had biostimulator injections. So he said that it looked almost like gritty bone-like material in the skin, which personally I found quite off-putting. But equally, I've had a lot of viewers comment where they've heard an aesthetic specialist saying, well, I wouldn't use them, saying I've had brilliant results with them. You know, how can you say that? There are some doctors who specialize in them and they just do it really, really well. I mean, have you tried any of these? And yeah. what, do you, what do you hear in the mix about them? I hear a lot of different opinions. Um, surgeons largely don't like things that will affect possible future surgery. The vast majority of people are never going to get as far as plastic surgery, but for the, so therefore the tweakments of various sorts, up to and including biostimulators, is something that they're more likely to do. But um, even um, you know the, the 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 ones who are not that keen on biostimulators say don't do them for like at least two years before having a facelift. But, but again, the, the surgeons don't like um, energy based treatments like radio frequency microneedling for the same reason because it, it 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 tightens the skin. I had one famous surgeon um, saying that whenever he opens a face up, it's a bit like going into an old junkyard. He never quite knows what he's going to find because <laughs> by the time people get to the stage of wanting a facelift, they have probably been having a go with non-surgicals over the years. And um, so there may be a fair lot that's gone on in that face. The ones who are being more charitable, the surgeons will say, it's not going to prevent them doing a facelift. It may make it slightly more difficult to separate the layers of tissue because energy-based devices are often kind of mashing those tissue layers together to get them to tighten up. But Back to biostimulators, which is what you were actually asking about. Yeah, I, I mean, they, 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 they come and go in, in, in waves of popularity. And Sculptra was hugely popular in the mid-noughties. I had masses of it in my face about 2005, 2006. And, and it was great. It was uh, a slow-growing, more gentle result than you'd get from filler. I didn't want a huge amount of filler in my mid-face at that time. People complain about the nodules you can get with it. That used to be a problem because of the way the product was reconstituted before injection. Now that really shouldn't be a problem. But, you know, I hear in my inbox from people who have had problems with it, you know, and again, as you were saying before, it comes down to having a really good practitioner who knows what they're doing, who's confident with that product. Um, but Sculptra is having a massive 
moment at um, you know the last year or so. Um, it's got um, clearance for body treatments. Um, it's used for balm enhancement for crepey skin all over. I'm sure I will have some quite soon. I haven't got around to it in the past year, but probably in my neck or something for skin quality rather than creating volume growth. It, it seems to be really good for that. I've seen a lot of lovely bits of before and after work. With before and afters, you know, it's always tricky because you're always going to see the very best, best yes, yeah. that are available and not everybody will get that result. And particularly the older you get, you know, the less your skin is going to respond because you've got less collagen in it for it to be stimulated to to grow more so you have to um factor that into the yeah that's equation. an important one actually that i don't often hear discussed that there are obviously better candidates for these treatments yeah. and i'm not sure everybody's aware of that i do get a lot of people saying also that they've tried something one of the biostimulators and it's done nothing for them and they feel like they've wasted a fortune with it so it's really quite hard to gauge um, as somebody who hasn't tried them, you know, is it worth it or not? Yeah, it, it's really hard. And that's why you need good advice from somebody who will say, um, you know, like if, if you are in your late 30s starting to notice the first signs of, of this and that skin quality slackening or wrinkles creeping in or whatever it is you don't like, you know, an energy treatment like um, microneedling or ultrasound or um, radio frequency microneedling or a collagen stimulating treatment like a, a biostimulator is a great idea because you've got so much more collagen then to stimulate. But again, because your skin isn't looking that bad, you won't see like a dramatic result. I think people are always hoping for a result that will in fact be more what you'd get from a facelift when in fact the changes are often quite subtle. I, I, I get people the whole time saying they tried Profilo, for example, which is a hyaluronic acid based um, injectable moisturizer. They are, they are for skin quality, but they have a regenerative sort of aspect to them. Um, and with some people that can be quite dramatic if they have drier skin but you, you need to have enough of it you need at least two rounds or if you're getting into your 50s probably three rounds of treatment that, that's all going to add up and if you don't have enough um, rounds of treatment you're, you're not going to see that full hydrating result that it can it can give um, and plenty of people say to me they didn't see anything and think well did you did you actually have really good clinical before and after pictures taken because mostly I can't tell a difference in my face in the mirror and I know from years of trying stuff it's only when I get under a either a Vizier imaging system which which looks in immense detail at the redness the pigmentation the lines etc and, and can perceive a difference from from one month to sort of four months later or 3D imaging where even with something like that fat transfer, you'd expect there to be a huge difference. It, it's just a millimetre or two here and there on a 3D or just very good pictures in in the clinic. Um, I haven't got them here, here to hand, but I, I had a filler treatment five, six years ago with 10 mils of filler. When, uh, That's hyaluronic of, acid, was it? With hyaluronic acid, when one of the companies was doing a protocol of, of, of using a lot to show how you could reshape the whole face in one go. Um, the Times was very interested in having an article on this, and they got me in for a photo shoot before and after. But there really wasn't any difference between the before and after pictures because they'd done a head-on shot. But when I went back to the clinic for my proper follow-up um, things done from different angles and filling faces, you could see that the change in my jawline, for example, was was massive to all intents and purposes. As far as the readers were concerned, I looked very much the same. So what was all that about? And you think, well, I don't want to look weird and vastly different. But so even with something like that, it, it takes seeing it from the right angles to see the right thing. So People often think they haven't got a result when they probably have. These technologies will be stimulating collagen in the skin. That will be doing you a lot of good more further down the line. But if, if it's not showing a huge amount at the moment, 
then it's very difficult to know whether you've wasted your money. Another thing people complain to me a lot about is they go and see a practitioner and they they feel they're being upsold. They say, but I only want this little thing done. I just want my lips done. Um, and the practitioner who would have been trying to explain to them some are better at doing it than others that if you just have your lips done, particularly um, for, for, for my lot who are often 45 plus, maybe 55 plus, and they haven't done anything and they think just having a lips will be, will be great. But it's like painting the front door of a house without attending to any of the foundational stuff around it. And it, you, you don't want to walk into a room and people to think, oh goodness, look at those lips. You know, you want everything to blend in. And because by the time, you know, we get to midlife plus, we've got bone loss going on in the face, we've got volume loss, we've got skin laxity, you know, it's, it's not a happy list. By the time you hit menopause and you lose estrogen from the skin, everything goes downhill that much faster. You know, if you, I, I am a big fan of HRT because having the estrogen back in your skin enables it to make collagen, hang on to hydration, to fight off environmental damage in the way that it used to. Multifactorial, as they say, isn't it? So many factors at play, yeah. And really difficult for people to decide on their own. So the best thing is to find a great doctor, nurse, surgeon, um, dermatologist, whoever is really well qualified in this, who can help address what is gonna make the most difference for the person in front of them. I mean, you talked about hyaluronic acid filler there and um, you did a brilliant piece about how an MRI scan showed that you still have 20 years worth, basically, of filler left in your face. In wow. fact, confusingly, there was like more filler showing up on the scan than you'd actually had in your face. But it did show us that it hangs around, you know, whatever was, the... It was the Daily Mail's interpretation. I don't think it was 20 years worth of filler. There, there's a kind of slightly saner version of that article on my, on, my, uh, on my website. But... I'll link to I, it. Yeah, thank you. I've been hearing this and lucky me, I get to go to conferences in the UK and internationally and you need to be linked with all these people all over the world. I had been hearing them talking about um, how long filler can last in the skin. Um, there's a couple of Australian doctors who had been looking at MRI imaging. Mostly it's done for filler that has been a problem. It has migrated, it has slightly walked off from where it was placed which doesn't happen automatically. Often filler stays exactly where it's put. Often filler breaks down like it's meant to and, and vanishes. But they were coming up with some fillers that were showing up many years later than they had been injected. I hadn't had any filler in my face for about four years at that point. And I thought this is probably the most filler free this face is ever going to be uh, going forward because I had bits here and there over the years. Uh, so I thought, oh, I'll go and I'll go and have an MRI, which is an expensive experiment, but fascinating because from the outside, it didn't look like there was anything wrong with it. But under the surface, um, I, uh, I watched the playback with the radiologist who'd done it and um, the doctor who'd referred me. We were all on Zoom and we were all just silent for a bit and then you know gobsmacked with the phrase the phrase that kept coming up saying like seriously all that much i've just done a um a, a video with a, a brilliant um beverly hills ocular plastic surgeon called cami parser who um has talked about this a, a, a good deal i met him at a conference last year he'd seen my article and had said he thought i'd just about got the point that that was enough filler that it can hang around and then he was horrified to read i'd gone off and had more filler after that um because i felt my face needed so i had to go catch him in the lunch queue and say hello you know <laughs> this is me I've, I've lived to tell the tale and he was kind enough to say that my face didn't look overfilled i i just, I just thought kind of like Oh, a long, thin face that goes hollow with age. So a bit here and there. It's or... it's really nicely balanced, your skin. Thank Do you. Would you mind sharing your age with my audience? Oh, no, at all. No, I'm 61. 61. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, thank you. I think I'm kind of into facelift territory, but... Um... <laughs> well, I am, and I'm at 51, so... Yeah. <laughs> You look lovely. I mean, the thing is, how much should we go around fussing about our 
our, our, our faces and yet you, you know it's then when you are down the pub with your friends and they say look look enough with all this otherwise you're going to be out of step with all of us and he, gosh yes I should bear that in mind because just because I'm hanging out a lot of the time with all these doctors and derms and nurses and surgeons who are always looking saying you know you could do a bit about that thing there and you were saying oh, oh guys guys give me a break I'm I'm sure I could but you know I'd rather concentrate on getting a getting a better night's sleep at the at the, at the moment so well um, do do you ever worry about how much you've had done because you've you've I mean oh, yeah. you've been brilliant really in that you have um you've tried everything on our behalf Hello, vain also lots of people drop me and I think oh I've booked in to see so and so and I'm looking forward to it but I'm really worried that is perfectly normal this is an unusual thing to go and do to yourself and yeah I am I feel that worry every single time I get up on the couch even now even after all these years and I still think, is this going to be the one that leaves me wearing a paper bag on my head for the rest of my days? Because it could be, you know, things randomly go wrong. I've had things go wrong. And, and what have you had go wrong? Um, often sort of minor things. The, the worst one was it was a laser procedure. Um, they were doing it up around the eyes. So perfectly correctly, I had um, ocular shields they're like metal contact lenses put into the eyes to protect the eyes from the laser were they left in too long was there not enough lubricant on them i don't know but the net result was they removed um a six millimeter by eight millimeter patch of epithelium which is the skin on your eyeball off each eyeball which i didn't really notice at first because everything was hurting and i had anesthetic drops in there but by the next morning, my eyes just streamed all night. I couldn't, I couldn't open my eyes. Rang the, the the surgeon who had done the work and said, you know, this is this is terribly wrong. Didn't help that it was a night we went into second lockdown. And you know, you can't go to A and E with aesthetic complications because it's not something they're qualified to handle, particularly in COVID. Anyway, it was it was hideous, and it took uh, months for the cornea to regrow and stop being swollen um and worse was the kind of the knock-on effect it left me with some kind of ptsd i mean not diagnosed as such but because again it's covid i just stayed in bed sort of shaking gently and finding it very hard to breathe smoothly for months which was a real uh kind of wake up call because i tend to crash on thinking oh i'll be fine so yeah so, so, so things can can go wrong and often it's much more normal small things like anything involving a needle could be bruising could be swelling what else have i had go wrong various various things that that, that kind of recover in time I, I do try and show on instagram when i'm having procedures done what what the recovery is like as long as the company involved hasn't sort of banned me from doing that it gets them a lot of attention though so often people will just see the before and after pictures um and you'll see this this is actually a pretty major procedure you you really ought to know what's involved and being told 10 days downtime is fine but but you don't always know what that looks like unless somebody has shared their pictures I, i'm always appalled by what people look like a day after a facelift but that is normal given what's been done to their faces particularly if it's a facelift where there's been also fat transfer also co2 lasering and there is recovery but i but i guess it, i i also want to try and show people that you your skin is amazing at recovering and there's lots of other things that can help with recovery like red light or injections of polynucleotides mixed with PRP and exosomes and everything else you know there's all sorts of things people can do and then generally I end up looking okay in the end yeah you do you're a real trailblazer because I look at you and I think well if she's had that much filler over the years and and her face is still looking good I mean it can't be that bad it it is just a practitioner isn't it um I mean is if, if you were left to your own devices right and you weren't yeah. you weren't having to try try things out um for, for the sake of it, what would you do? What would your sort of annual maintenance regime look like? What's my budget? Well, you've got an unlimited budget. If you just were just like, right, knock yourself out, do what you want to do. Would would some of the traditional ones, the Botox? Oh, always, 
yes, I haven't. I haven't talked about what I what I do apart, aside from um, all the things I'm doing for work because a lot of the time I'm trying things out in order to do a video, a promotional video about them for the company involved and people might think, well, that, that's going to sort of skew your perception. But I will only go and uh, try things which I understand to be good and safe uh, and I will only go and do them with doctors, nurses, surgeons, whoever, who, who are really good at doing them. But yeah, with a, I, I do a lot of toxin every three months um, and I have it all over my face, which again can rock up very expensive. So in the forehead, around the crow's feet, um, because, because I have a, a, a lot in the um, masseter muscles is what the word I'm struggling for, because I grind my teeth and... Um, and that is a huge relief having that done. You know, anybody who grinds their teeth will know, you know, you get neck pain, you get headaches. I have the toxin in the platysma, the, the bands down here, the bands of muscle, which can get a bit sort of stringy. Uh, they're not bad at the moment, but, but injecting those softens them. I also love it in my armpits. Okay, for sweat control? Sweat, just, which is a completely unnecessary icing on the cake kind of thing. And you don't yes. worry about muscle loss? Because no. that's the thing. I mean, I managed to put myself off everything, Alice. It's just ridiculous, oh. you know, because I hear yeah. so much of the bad side sure. of things. And I think, mm. oh gosh, I know I don't want to lose my muscle movement. So I will have Botox here yeah. every nine months because I want to sort of fully recover my, yes. my muscle strength before I do yeah. it again. But I mean, I'm looking at you again you're 10 years on and like your neck's not hanging off. So it's obviously worked for you. It, you need a practitioner who's going to judge what you actually need in your face. Um, the practitioner who's been doing my toxin for the last year or two is Dr. Sophie Schotter. She sort of laughs when she's injecting my frontalis, this muscle around here, which lifts, because she says if she put that much in her own forehead, it would crash right down. She uses six times as much in my forehead as she would on her own. So people, a lot of people will do toxin injections like paint by numbers, but they can't really because our faces are all different. That's where it goes wrong. You need somebody to assess what what will be appropriate. And I, I, I always used to um, wait till all the movement came back in just to see where it is. And I want to know that those muscles are working. I mean, you if you if you keep whacking them with huge doses, um, then they will atrophy if completely unused and yet you know where toxin has been used much more over the years is in in children with cerebral palsy you know who, who have spasticity in their limbs difficulty controlling their limbs and so toxin injections can help give them the control over those limbs it's been it's been used for decades and decades like that um, and in doses that are like 40 50 times greater than cosmetic doses uh, and yet the muscle activity comes back time after time. It, it's not so much the Botox wearing off because the, 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 the toxin stops the nerve signal from getting across from the nerve that's saying contract to the muscle receptors that are receiving that. Um, it blocks those receptors. So the nerve is saying, go on, do whatever. It's like, la, 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 can't hear you. But um, after a while the muscle grows new receptors so the nerve signal starts getting across um, and, and that process can be repeated again and again and again which which is what makes to toxin such a fascinating drug because it is really well tested and i know people sort of think oh everyone's going off it now but you think they're not really it's been the worldwide number one treatment for a very long time it is every clinics bread and butter yeah so you think it'll be around for years to come as i as i feel it's, it's slightly to a slightly lesser degree but everyone thinks oh all this chipmunk cheeks and overstuffed lips we've seen people have gone off fillers in a big way they haven't really um it, there's just this awareness and that's the perception it's still it's still a very popular treatment but there are now so many other things so in your in your no holds barred maintenance routine. You're okay. using toxin quite a lot. Bits of filler as and where, like just to prop up the bits that are. So you wouldn't go back to the Sculptra, for instance, you would just keep using 
that basic hyaluronic acid filler as your, your top up. I'd use the hyaluronic acid filler for replacing volume in bits like the temples, um, angle of the jaw, chin, bit for sort of soft volume in the front of the cheeks, this kind of bit here. What I have also tried is um, a, a hybrid filler called Harmonica, which is half hyaluronic acid and half um, calcium hydroxyapatite. So it gives um, an initial soft bit of volume. And how they use that is with a cannula, which is like a blunt needle and injected not in a blob, um, but in a sort of fan shape around in these kind of the, the bit around here, which can start to look a bit floppy and gaunt. And that's very good for skin quality. It's strengthening it. So I dare say Sculptra could do that. Um, Sculptra possibly in the neck is where I would be tempted to try it, something like that. Or Radies, hyper dilute Radies. Radies is um, the biostimulator with calcium hydroxyapatite in it. Sculpture is polyolactic acid, so they're similar stimulating things. Um, so it's more like a wash of the stuff to G up the skin and make it produce more collagen. Energy treatments, I do yes. like energy treatments. I mean, I think it's one of the best things people can do is is a, a course of microneedling. Um, RF microneedling with the radio frequency. Just even just plain microneedling is great because it stimulates skin renewal. Um, and it goes on stimulating skin renewal for quite a long time after the treatment. So if you have a course of six treatments a month apart, that'll do a power of good. The radio frequency microneedling, when the microneedles go in there, it gives a zap of radio frequency at the same time. So you've got a double whammy of skin tightening and the sort of wound healing that the needles are creating. That, so that is even more powerful. It's a lot more expensive as well. And um, so something like that for tightening the skin, <laughs> then um, light treatments like IPL or laser for taking down pigmentation or the redness from uh, rosacea, you know, IPL is really good for that. Again, IPL is, I feel it often gets overlooked because it's it's not new, it's not sexy, it's not, <clears throat> it's not that expensive. But um, for for certainly in midlife, if you're getting flushing and you're getting all these little broken veins, it's brilliant. Um, uh, laser for clearing pigmentation, bit of skin tightening. If I was feeling brave, I would go and see one of the guys who does really hardcore lasering for my lip lines. <laughs> Again, I, I, I see all these lovely practitioners that, that we, we've just got the autumn season of conferences and everything coming up, and I know. They look at me and then you think, ah. They're assessing your face every time. <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, some of them are too polite to say it. Others are more direct and says, you know, you really should come and see me about. What one of them said last year, your chin. Oh, no, I would hate that. And, and I said, yeah, OK. And, and then I have. What was up with your chin? What did they think the problem was with your chin? Oh, it needed. I, I, I couldn't quite see it myself, so I didn't entirely understand. And then as luck would have it, somebody else injected my chin, not entirely by accident, but but while they were at something else the other week. And then I saw the original guy and he said, oh, not like that. Um, he's a super eminent professor and I, I, I can't barge into your schedule and say whatever this tiny thing is in my chin. Oh, and then some, and then some Profilo. If I had an unlimited budget, I would do buckets and buckets of Profilo everywhere. Actually, Profilo, you're not meant to use it up, but I think they are widening the protocols. But for skin quality there, all the way down here. Oh, and hands. Oh, you're making me feel a little braver now because I've really gone off a lot of things by talking to too many doctors who are a bit like, oh, I wouldn't do that or I wouldn't do that or just, just finding out what some of the things that could go wrong, I think has put me off a lot of stuff. Can we talk just uh, very quickly about um, fat loss related to energy treatments? Because, you know, depending on who you talk to, doctors who, you know, that that's, that's their bread and butter, they'll always say, oh, no, I mean, that's not a thing. It's completely controllable. I do this, that and the next thing to avoid it. But I've had a lot of people, and I know that there are quite big Facebook groups out there, support groups and so on, for people who have had definite fat loss relating to radio frequency and ultrasound. To me, it's a thing. Um, it, it, it is a thing, and it absolutely can happen. 
the doctors who practitioners who say they uh, it's all controllable, they are right. It is controllable. Ultrasound, it kind of depends though, because some of the systems have an imaging thing that shows where each energy is landing in the skin, others don't. In which case, I think, uh, you know, and they say, oh, well, you might get some tightening, you might get some fat loss. And you, wow, as long as you're okay with both of those. Um, well, but- well, sometimes if it was like under the chin and you had a lot of fat under there, you'd be, you know, I'd be signing up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of the practitioners will use um, radio frequency needling, particularly deliberately to target fat under the skin, because if you go in deeper, but because, you know, you, you, you've got the skin, you've got the, 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 the fat layer that's under the skin. If you drive all that heat energy, which is what radio frequency is, into the fat, it will melt it. So a lot of the people who do um, radio frequency microneedling on the stomach, for example, you want to use the needles longer, you want to get in the fat, you want to tighten the skin and zap the fat at the same time. And, and as you say, under the, under the chin, that can work really nicely or in a heavy lower face. But if that's not what you want, if your practitioner doesn't maybe have the confidence to get it right, then... Um, yeah, then, then, then that's a recipe for disaster. Or I always think if they were in complete denial about it and were like, oh no, that's not a thing, that doesn't happen, that would be a red flag to me. I'd be thinking, no, I want to hear about what, how that you understand it and you, yeah. I want you to tell me how you control that risk. Yes, or, or you simply go for radio frequency microneedling with a system that uses much shorter needles. Um, I've, I've just refreshed it actually, on, on, on the, or updated the article on the website. I wrote about our therapy six years ago and... Um, you know, I'd had at that stage three rounds of treatment with L-therapy over the previous five, six years, you know, successful. But lucky me, I'm always being treated by really good practitioners. So uh, so they know their stuff. But I have had so much um, correspondence over the years from people who have had disasters with it. However much the company says um, it shouldn't happen or these were... Um, bootleg devices or, you know, and I know that, that there's a counterfeit market in aesthetic devices and they will nick the branding and marketing materials from the authentic place so it can be hard to tell. But even given all that, there's an awful lot of people unhappy with the results and um, it is a thing. So, yeah, you want to be very confident in your practitioner. Uh, like everything else, there's no easy way to pick that perfect person. Um, but I guess, you know, experience. And I love to look on Instagram and see people's results over and over again, looking at the before and afters. You know, how do those faces look? Do they look natural to me? Um, how many patients are they they're getting? What are, what are the reviews like? Word of mouth is always uh, still one of the best recommendations if you have friends who do this and we'll talk about it. Final question. I mean, there's so much more I could ask you. Do you use any devices at home? I'm thinking about the LED mask, the likes of the Lima laser or the Nira or... Lima laser is a a load of rubbish. Um, Because um, I saw some research about that the other day and I was thinking, should I do a dedicated video about that? They'd done some research rubbishing LED masks. Yeah, it was in the paper yesterday and and they've sponsored a study, which which is great because they've had so much coverage for that. Um, and yet they have no clinicals. They lent me one a few years ago, which I used and tried and uh, got no results from. I started taking it around the conferences with me, grumbling to my laser pals saying, what do you reckon to this? And they said, Alice, that's a laser pointer. That's not a laser. And I said, it is a laser. They say it's a low level laser and they charge two grand for this. And they're persuading people it will give them the results that your machine, and they say, look at our machines. Why do you think our machines are this? Anyway, this goes on and on. And then they say, well, look, Alice, if you understood the first thing about photonics, and you, well, I don't, I don't. So, but one of them took the device and took it to their lab and ran the various tests on it. It really wasn't putting out very much. Now they've got this new Pro, which version with red light on it. Uh, I don't, I don't really know. They say it does all these wonderful things. I did, the PR had offered to had come on very strong in whenever it was, February or whenever it launched. Uh, and I said, yeah, great, lend it to me. I'll, I'll do a proper full three-month trial. Um, and then suddenly she backed off uh, and said, oh, no, there aren't any available. Because she'd seen what you'd said about the, the last one. <laughs> 
possibly. But yeah, LED, LED, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that the cheaper home use ones really do anything, the 300, 400 pound ones. Um, I have got a, a, a clinic standard one, um, the Dermalux Flex, either that or the Saluma. Saluma has some, which is, they are the original ones in, in, in this area, huge in the States, very flexible devices um, and those some of their devices start from about 1200 which is a lot but on the other hand it will give you results it will definitely definitely it, it's medically certified equipment for pain relief for wound healing for reducing inflammation uh, none of these other things ha ha can claim anything like that they'll, they'll say oh it's all NASA inspired technology and he, yeah, they are red lights and they're using the same wavelengths, but it's slightly like saying this amazing Ferrari uses petrol engine technology and it can go at speeds of whatever. You can say and this Skoda also uses amazing petrol engine technology, but it doesn't kind of quite do what that one does. I don't, I don't know what the right analogy is. Yeah, no, I hear you. To me... The results are very superficial, but having used red light, I have a panel. I used to use a mask and I, and I thought that was good, but I, I use a panel now and it's not skin tightening. It's not going to do anything dramatic, but skin health, I think there's something in it. I just think yeah. for complexion. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I love it. It, it takes down inflammation in the skin. It, it, it genuinely does sort of improve skin quality over time but you have to use it quite a lot but I, I love I love microcurrent um I know the little um ones you use on your face at home they are not going to give you a facelift but if I'm having a tired morning and I can get it to pick up my eyebrows that bit and, and just the massaging of the skin I think getting the blood flow to your skin um I think is very helpful yeah. Help, helps with blood flow helps with all of that there's a new one, I can't quite remember its name, it's called something like Anteage, which is radio frequency and microcurrent, which I've got to try. But I'm waiting for the toxin to wear off a bit first because it, it claims to reduce wrinkles, by, and I think all it, 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 it's never going to make as obvious and immediate a difference as injections of toxin that just sort of soften those wrinkles. So I've got to wait for the wrinkles to come back and have a go. And there's also an, a NIRA laser, N-I-R-A. Yeah, I use that a bit now. Okay, have you got the pro version? I've got the I've got the pro. Yeah, I had tried the precision before. Um, and I interviewed their um, creator because I wasn't really. I, a lot of people had said it's got its fans, but a few people had said to me um, that they felt it left their skin looking worse. And now, this is my theory. After interviewing their founder, I thought. There, there is there is something to this. It's heating the, the water in your skin. I, I got it, I got it how it worked. So I started using it again on my brow, a little bit around my eyes and um, jawline. I like it, but I don't use it every day. And my theory is that if you use it daily, it can dry your skin. Okay. That's my theory. Interesting. Um, use it every other day. And he had said in their clinical trials that those using it at 50% had been seeing results. So I thought I'm going to use it at 50%. 50%. And okay. I, yeah, I like the um, I like the effect. I might give a go to my um, my lip lines with that, see if I can make a change. The trouble is it, it takes a long time and consistency. And with all these devices, when people are dropping me a line saying, should they get the whatever? Are you going to use it? Are you going to use it every day? Do you like it? Would you not be better off doing, I don't know, lovely facial massage, bit of guac? Just doing a one-off IPL yeah. treatment or laser treatment or something. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, we will be looking out um, to, I'll link to your channel and your Instagram and your website so that we can continue to follow uh, your results with your treatments. And thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. I've loved it. Not at all. Fantastic talking to you. So along with the links to the Treatments Guide website and Alice's social accounts in the description, I will also include links to the home devices we discussed in more positive terms today. And for those of you who are new to my channel, I'm a journalist on a mission to help you and me age well, look and feel better for longer. So if you enjoyed this episode and haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe or follow so you don't miss future content from me. You'll find more advice and information from me on my website on 
wellness.scott and there's a link in the description of this episode and at the bottom of any page on my website where you can sign up to my free monthly newsletter. I round up all my latest content in it so you don't miss a thing and I often run giveaways through the newsletter too. But for now, thank you so much for being here today and I hope to see you next time. Mm -hmm.